word for the new year, I had to immediately get in prayer, if you know what I'm saying. So uh, uh, I understand as a pastor the responsibility of making sure that whoever you allow to come into your pulpit knows the Lord, and, and I don't take this responsibility lightly. So I want to honor all of the other leaders, Pastor Tony and uh, Ms. Michelle and all the leaders that are in the house today. I don't know all of you by name, but I also want to honor you, Faith Family Church, just for who you are, being the servants and saints of God. Amen. Amen. Um, I am excited to be here today, and I do feel that the Lord has given me a word for you all as we cross over into this new season. Um, Pastor Stanley has shared with me his prophetic vision, his prophetic word that God has given our church or your church, our church, because we're all one body, right? Amen. Our church for the new year, which is that your life is about to get 10 times better. Amen. It's about to get 10 times better. And I really believe that if 2018 was a year of transition, then 2019 is a year of promise. Amen. If 2018 was a year of disappointment, then 2019 is a year of appointment. The great things are about to happen. But in order for our life to get 10 times better, then we must go 10 times deeper. Yeah. Because we need to be 10 times stronger. Yes. Because the reason that God wants to bless us is so that we can steward his blessings and show the world what children of God look like. Come on. That's good news this morning. I want to share something with you that God has put on my heart, put in my spirit. Um, as we get started today, um, I heard Pastor Stanley last week, he preached on nonconformity, not, not conforming to the world, to the culture of the world. He used one of my favorite scriptures, which is in the book of Romans chapter 12. That's actually one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, because it not only talks about who we are to be as living sacrifices, but then it goes on to explain why we should be living sacrifices, because we are members of one another. We are a body. The Bible says that individually, we're a part of each other. And we shouldn't think more highly of ourselves Amen. than we ought, yes. right? But we should out-honor each other. Amen. That's pretty amazing. Amen. And if, any, if we need anything in this world that we live in today, it's honor Amen. and it's respect for one another. Amen. And I heard him say as he began his message that you can look at what we're living in as bad times or you can look at what we're living in as good times. Yes. And I choose to look at what we're living in as very encouraging times. Yes. I know that a lot of people would tell you that the church is declining and that people are leaving the church. And that may be true, but it may be that that needs to happen in order for the real believers yes. to shine yes. in this darkness that we're living in. Yes. Yeah. It seems as though the culture, the philosophy, and the politics of the world have infiltrated the church. That the body of Christ is now divided along the same lines as the world. This is scary to many, it's shaking to others, and it has a lot of people reevaluating their faith. But I challenge you that this is no different than what Paul faced and what Paul wrote about in the New Testament. And that what we are seeing happen in the body of Christ today is simply God destroying religious strongholds and mindsets that have perpetrated themselves as revelations of him. Yeah. I want to re-say that one more time. Yes. I believe that what we're watching happen today, in this time that we're living in, is God is beginning to destroy the religious strongholds and mindsets that have perpetrated themselves right. as revelations of who he is. Yeah. That's good news. Yeah. I challenge you that our Father, our good, good Father, is calling us to a deeper relationship and to a new level of commitment through which will come a knowledge and a revelation of him that can't be shaken, can't be challenged, and can't be undermined. New dimensions of the Spirit are available to those who are willing to yield themselves to the transforming power of God's grace. Yes, this dimension is access through devotion. And I don't mean a devotion on your telephone. I mean a life that is committed to God. Yes. Yes and a longing to see God's nature and the image of Christ being manifested in the earth. To see this broken world recognize that there is power in our healing Savior. In this season that we're entering into, vain traditions and repetitions will not sustain us. Only an abiding faith and a deep knowing and a pure unselfish love for God will sustain us in these times ahead. Right. I challenge you that while we're waiting on God, that God is waiting on us. Yeah. He says that our access has been granted in the book of Ephesians. And the question is, are we willing to go into the secret place? Are we willing to go into the most holy place? 
the quiet caverns of our heart and allow him to transform our nature by destroying the idols that have taken residence in our private life. Yes. God is saying today that we are his answer, yes. that he is ready to unleash his power, but he must prepare us to be stewards of his presence. I want to say that one more time. God says he's ready to unleash his power, but he must prepare us to be stewards of his presence. See, he is preparing sons and daughters, sons and daughters for this time that we live in, agents of change, transformers of society. So prepare yourself to be challenged because the kingdom of God is at hand. I have a word for you today, Faith Family Church. The word today is go in, go on, go in, and go out. Right. To go on, to go in, and then to go out. Yeah. I'm not used to preaching the same message twice in a day, so we're going to try something new today. All right? <laughs> Pastor Stanley has given you guys a word from God, and he's going to break down the vision that God has given him for you and for this church. And it's that your life is about to get ten times better, that everything in your life is about to change. Right. And I want to share with you today a pattern and principle of the Bible. If you don't know, the Bible is a book of patterns and it's a book of principles. It's an eternal truth. It's a revelation of God to his people. But it's also patterns and principles. And the patterns and principles of the Bible never change. They are eternal. And when you recognize the patterns and you begin to apply the principles, then you can live in the power of the promise. When you recognize the patterns and you begin to apply the principles, you then can live in the power of the promises. One of my greatest Patterns of the Bible is the children of Israel. I love to study the Old Testament. I see myself when I read about the children of Israel. Yeah. And, and I want to pick up their story when they were in Egypt and they had cried out to God for a deliverer. And God called a man named Moses. Yeah. And he said, Moses, he took a stuttering murderer. <laughs> Come on. He took a man who the world says disqualified. Yeah. You can't be a prince of Egypt. You can't be a Hebrew. Moses didn't know who he was. Yeah. Yeah. So he found himself on the backside of a mountain. Yeah. And there alone by himself, contemplating his life, contemplating his identity, yeah. contemplating his mistakes, contemplating his failures, contemplating his purposes. What am I here for? Right. Tending sheep. God spoke to him through a burning bush. Yes. It was at that moment that Moses received the mandate from God. Of course, he does like all of us do, but not me, Lord. Yeah. I, I can't do that. I can't even speak right. I'm not an eloquent speaker, yeah. as he would say, though we have been educated in the house of Pharaoh. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Right? right? The greatest libraries of ancient history. Yeah. You know, the greatest, yeah. the greatest oracles of ancient history. Egypt yeah. was an amazing civilization. Right, right. I told you to do yeah. I think there are some of us sitting in this room today. God has called us. Yeah. God has given us a ministry. God has given us a purpose. Yeah. God has laid a mandate on our life. And we're saying, God, not me. Yeah. God, my past disqualifies me. God, my failures are too many. God, my mistakes are too much for you to overcome. But I'm here to tell you that there's nothing too much for God. Amen. That God didn't just save us to come to church on Sunday. I love church on Sunday. I'm a, I'm a pastor. He didn't just save us to come and, and sing songs with our amazing worship leader. I love your authenticity, by the way. I really appreciate your worship. Thank you. You blessed me this morning. And that's not the reason that he saved us. Yeah. That's the fruit of our salvation, yeah. but it's not the purpose of our salvation. You see, God calls us out of darkness and into his marvelous light yeah. because he wants the world to know that he's real. Yeah. He wants the world to understand that your future is not determined by your failures, yeah. that your mistakes don't make you. Yeah. We might have made some mistakes, but our mistakes don't make us. Yeah. That anyone can overcome, that men and women can change. Yeah. You know, I did used to work for the Fatherhood Initiative, and we would help men that were coming out of prison get reconnected to their children. And I'm amazed at how the system works. I mean, you have a man that's been locked down for five years, and they're still charging him child support. And he, he comes out of prison with a new outlook on life or, or thinking he can, and he can't even get a driver's license because he has warrants for child support. Right. Wow. And I'm like, man. And, and I would go with these men, and I would be an advocate at child support court. And, and you know, the court system does not believe that men can change. Come on. They do not believe that people can change. If any of you have ever been to court, I don't know about you, but I, I, I've done a little time. 
Yeah. Oh no, I might be in the wrong house. <laughs> I don't know. I hadn't always been saved, you know what I'm saying? But but you know, I made some mistakes. And, and when I would go before a judge, half the time he wouldn't even look at me. The first thing he looked at was my jacket. Wow. Yeah. They call that your folder, your yeah. file. And within that file was every mistake that I had ever made. Yeah. Everything that I had ever been charged with. Yeah. Everything that I had ever done time for was there. And he would look at that thing before he would even look at me. Yeah. And once he looked at that, he would look up and look at the prosecutor and say, what's he done now? Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. See, he was judging me yeah. according to my past. Yeah. And what I'm trying to tell you is that if last year was a was a year of mistakes, maybe it was a year of disappointments, maybe it was a year of what seemed to be empty promises, that this year is a year of promise. This year is a year of fulfillment. The children of Israel were slaves in Egypt. God called a failure to deliver them. He called a man that had made some mistakes, a man whose past was blemished. A man who didn't have it all figured out, and he said, I want you to go stand before the greatest man in the land and tell him, you're going to let my people go. <laughs> if you're going to do great things for God, you're going to have to face some fear. Right. If you're going to be what we talked about earlier, a son, a daughter, a steward of his presence, an agent of change, a transformer of society, yes. then we're going to have to face some fear. Yes. We're going to have to be courageous. We're going to have to have a depth of understanding. We're going to have to go 10 times deeper in order to be 10 times better. Because we need to be 10 times stronger. The children of Israel came out of the desert, came out of Egypt and went into a desert. The first place that they went was to the Red Sea. Does anybody know what the Red Sea represented to them? A dead end. <laughs> So I've got a word from God, I've got a promise from the Lord, and, and he's delivered me, and Egypt's given me all their riches, all their gold, and all their silver, and I'm on my way, and I'm feeling happy, and go lucky, and all of a sudden, I hit a dead end. Has anybody ever hit a dead end in here this morning? Maybe you started off last year, you was going to lose a certain amount of weight, you was going to save a certain amount of money, you were going to eliminate a certain amount of debt, but somewhere along the way, by February, it always seems like we hit a dead end. Is anybody with me today? But see, what happened is they thought it was a dead end, but God saw it as an opportunity to reveal himself to them in a way that they hadn't known him yet. You see, when they came to the dead end, they had the Red Sea here, and they had the Pharaoh chasing them down, because by this time, he had changed his mind. And I need to tell you this morning, there are some people who may, may say they're willing to let you go, but they're always going to try to chase you down. Y'all with me today? Just because they say they're going to let you go don't mean they're done with you yet. They're still going to talk about you. They're still going to wonder where you're at. They're still going to pop up on your Facebook page and your Instagram. Anybody with me today? Yeah. See, so you got to know who God is. And so what, what happened is there was an opportunity for God to reveal himself as a real deliverer. See, it's one thing to sing about him being our deliverer. It's one thing to hear a preacher preach about him being our deliverer. But it's another thing to watch him deliver us from who we used to be. And when you come through that process of deliverance, you'll understand God in a way that you never knew him before. See, you'll understand what it means to be a son or what it means to be a daughter and not just to be a slave. Yeah. Are you with me today? God is a father at the core of his being. And he's looking for children that imitate him, that look like him, that sound like him, and that reflect his nature to a world that don't know him. Yes. Are y'all with me today? Yes. yes. They come to this Red Sea. Eventually they cross over. God's performing these miracles. And guess what happens once they get across? They put their faith in a man. And when the man goes up on a mountain and he stays gone a little longer than they expected, right. February comes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. February comes. They got tired. They got wore out. They got burdened. They began to give up. They began to doubt. The fear and insecurity, the slave mentality began to kick in and tell them, who do you think you are? How in the world could you be children of God? You're just a few slaves from Egypt. 
And that, and that doubt and that insecurity and that fear began to go and, and the leader wasn't there to speak to him and the leader wasn't there to direct him. And, but guess yeah. what? God says, don't put your faith in men. Yeah. Right. Men will always fail you. Men will always let you down. He said, I want them to know me. And what they did is they took their blessings and they made it their idols. Yeah. 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 They took the gold and they took the yeah. silver and they began to create a calf that they could worship. Right. Because they needed something they could see. Yeah. They needed something that they can feel. And I'm trying to tell you that everything we see going on in the world today, yeah. what's going on with our young people, what's going on in our country, what's going on in our politics, is because people need something they can see. Yeah. They need something they can feel. And what I'm trying to tell you is that God has made you the agent of change for the world that we live in. People need to see God in you. They need to see God work through you. Yeah. That's your word for 2019. Yeah. We all know the story. God was telling them about a promise. Moses was speaking to them about a promise. There was a distant land that he was trying to paint a picture of. There was a distant place where he was trying to tell them. But guess what? I don't, I don't know if he had ever seen it either. Yeah. Through the lens that God wanted him to see it through. Yeah. Because there comes a place in the story where he sends over some spies. Let me, let me just make sure that this promise is real. Y'all with me today? Yes. He sends them over. They go over. You have 12 spies, one from each tribe. And they see the fruit of the land. They see the promise of God. They can see it. They can feel it. They can touch it. They begin to eat from it. They pick it up to bring it back to the camp. And then they see some giants. Yes. And what happens is that 10 of the spies look at the giants and they take their gaze off of the fruit. Yeah. They allow the giants to take their focus away from the promise of God and put it on the things of man. Yeah. See, if 2018 was a distraction for us, maybe some of us along the way got distracted. Yeah. Maybe we had a child that left home and hasn't come back. Maybe we had a prayer that we wrote down at the beginning of last year, but we haven't seen it come to pass. But I'm trying to tell you, get your gaze off of man. Get yeah. your gaze off of disappointment. The story goes that they came back, ten spies gave a bad report, and two guys, two spies gave a good report. Yeah. Caleb and Joshua, two men of faith, said, no, we can take the land. God has gone before us. God has made a way. God, he actually said that God has taken their strength. Yes. He's taken their strength, and he's given them to us. Yes. And you know what happened when they began to speak by faith? They wanted to stone with that. Yeah. So you can't worry about the naysayers in 2019. Right. You can't worry about the people who don't want to go where you want to go. Right. You can't keep allowing those old friends who have doubt and unbelief and, yeah. and they allow the world to determine who they are. Pastor Stanley said last week, we've got to be non-conforming. Yeah. Yeah. We can't conform to the world. We have to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Yeah. How does God renew our mind? He gives us revelations of who he is. How do we get revelations? I have to go to places where what I think is true yeah. <laughs> can't hold me anymore. Yeah. In other words, there's a process of transition. There's a process of crossing over. There's a process of going from one place to another place. Yeah. And just like the children of Israel, God never takes us out of one place unless he's going to take us into another place. Yeah. See, he brought them out of slavery to take them to a promise. Yes, but in between the, the promise and the slavery was a transition. Yes. We call that a process. Yes. Yes. Some of us have been in a process. Yes. But we're about to walk into a promise. Yes. You feel me? I see. It. It's time to come alive in you. Yes. You see, because this pattern and principle that's true for them is true for us. We are the children of God. We are his chosen. We have been grafted in by the blood of Jesus. We were slaves to sin. We were slaves to death. We were slaves to corruption. But Jesus repositioned us. He brought us back. The word redeemed means to purchase, to ransom, to buy back. I was on the block. I was lost and confused, but he came and said, I'll take his sin. I'll take his crime. I'll take his failures. I'll take his mistake. I'm going to cover him with me. The Bible says that God covers us with the righteousness of Christ. So I've been repositioned. I went from a slave to a son. If you study this out in scripture, what you'll find is that when they use the word adoption, that, that, that in the Roman culture, what would happen is that a slave would be working and a man would make him a son. He would bring him into his house. 
He would give him a robe. He would give him a ring that had the family name on it so he could stamp it. That means he carried his name. He had his authority. And he would give him sandals on his feet. And he would receive the same inheritance as the rest of the children. He would say, you've been found faithful. You're a good steward. Sometimes he would have more rights than the natural sons. To be repositioned. In Romans 8, 15, it says that we're no longer slaves to fear. We're no longer in bondage to fear, but we receive the spirit of adoption, the spirit of sonship, the spirit of daughtership by which we cry out, Abba, Father. I'm telling you that this pattern and principle of the children of Israel is the pattern and principle of our life. What happened when these men began to speak by faith is they wanted to kill them. They wanted to stone them. And I'm telling you that in this new season, in this crossing over, you can't worry about the naysayers. You need to separate from those who mean you no good. Separate from those who keep holding you back. Some of them are family members. Some of them are friends. Some of them we've known a long time. It doesn't mean you hate them. It means you love them, but you got to move on. Yeah. Because of their disobedience. They were stuck. For 40 years, they were stuck. God said, you'll never see the promise because you live in doubt, you live in fear, and you live in disobedience. The two men that made it to the promised land, the only two men that came out of Egypt that made it to the promised land were Joshua and Caleb. The two men that lived by faith. The two men that spoke faith. And I want to pick up this story right here as I give you my, my three little points for today, because that's what preachers do. We give you three points. And I'm encouraging you with this word. Like I said, I have a lot of admiration for your pastor as a leader and a man of God and the way he communicates the word. So I come to encourage you today. I come to set this new year off right for, for you. That you know you can put the disappointments and the discouragements and the failures of last year behind you. Not just last year, the last 20 years, the last 10 years, the last 5 years. It's time to let it go. It's time to forgive people. It's time to forgive yourself. It's time to count your losses. It's time to cut off the dead things. And it's time to cross over into the promise of God. The children of Israel were stuck. And then it comes time for them to cross over. And we pick up the story in the book of Joshua. God tells Joshua, he says, I want you to go, get the priest, grab the Ark of the Covenant. I don't know if you know this, but the Ark of the Covenant represents the Spirit of God. And see, God goes before them. God goes before us. God makes the crooked things straight. Some of us have been afraid to do what God has asked us to do. But I'm telling you that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. And that doesn't just mean a preacher that's preaching scripture. If you look up the word in that scripture, it's the word rhema. It means a revelation, a word spoken from God to your spirit. And when you walk out on that word, when you step out in faith, you begin to activate the promise of God on your life. See, because God never asks you to do something that he hasn't already prepared to be done, that he hasn't already done for you. You've got to believe that today, that that thing that's sitting dormant inside of you, that dream, that aspiration, that miracle, that testimony, that thing that you've been struggling with, you've got to believe today that God is breathing life on it today, that it's your faith that's going to activate the fruit of that promise in your life. Are y'all excited as I am today? I told him earlier, y'all probably never seen a white boy preach like this. I know Pastor Stanley's going to watch this. And Pastor Stanley, I love you. I thank you. God bless you. Amen. So they come to this place. They've been stuck. They've been wondering, wondering, just wondering, sitting complacent, mediocrity, not believing that anything's ever going to happen, going around the same mountain over and over and over. Yeah. I remember times in my life where I was just doing the same thing over and over and over. And even sometimes in church, it just seems like the same thing over and over. It's like clockwork. I can do it without thinking about it. Get up, get dressed, show up, eight thirty, pray, worship, sing, listen, five, five, go eat. That's all. <laughs> Get up Monday, hit the clock, do the job, punch the clock, go home, point, and it becomes routine. Yeah. And there's no life in it. There's no vibrancy in it. There's no purpose in it. And we begin to detach. And we begin to get complacent. And things begin to creep into our life because we've lost relationship. Yeah. You see, you've got to fight for this promise. Yeah. 
Pastor Stanley told us last week that when we decide to be nonconformist, when we, when we want our life to be ten times better, that it doesn't come without pressure. It doesn't come without tribulation. I'm here to tell you that pressure precedes power. Yes. Yes. That pressure molds us. Pressure makes us. Resistance is what strengthens us. When everybody says we can't, but we know God spoke, so I can. Yes. When everybody says we shouldn't, but we know God spoke, so I will. Come on, that's where you get strong. That's where you begin to recognize, realize, and have revelation of God in new dimensions. When it's just you and him. When everybody else is saying, no, 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 no. But yeah. God's saying, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Come on. <laughs> they came to this place. Joshua had been faithful. He had followed their leader. And now the mantle was turned over to him. Because of his faithfulness, he was ready to receive his promise. Because of his ability to not join Miriam and Aaron and all the other naysayers, if you read back in the Bible, his faithfulness was to Moses, was to the man of God. Some of you need to be faithful this year to the man of God. Be faithful to the house of God. You need to renew your faithfulness to this church. You need to renew your faithfulness to faith family. Show up on time. Get involved. Serve. Come on. I know he's going to love me for that. I'm a pastor. I know what it's like to try to motivate people. Yeah. But see, when something happens on the inside, when something begins to click and there comes a revelation of God and the spirit comes alive, no one has to beg you to do anything for the kingdom. Right. It begins to flow out of you. Come on. It stops being what you do and it becomes who you are. Amen. Amen. You see, what you do might not determine who you are, but who you are will always determine what you do. See, we're ultimately going to do what we believe. And I thought I might be able to fake it through January, but when February rolls around, the truth's going to come out. Yes, sir. Pastor, Franley talk, he, Pastor Stanley talked about fried foods last week. Was that last week you talked about? Yes, yeah, his love for fried. Yeah, yeah, you'll see me in February. <laughs> <laughs> My wife says, babe. I'm like, babe. <laughs> They were at this place of cross and roll. I'm going I'm to reel all this in real quick. Give you three quick points about what we want to do. We have to first go on. We have to go on. We have to move beyond our wondering. We have to move beyond our wilderness. We have to move beyond our letdowns. We have to move beyond our disappointments. We have to move beyond what hasn't worked out for us in life. We have to move beyond people that have hurt us. We have to move beyond people that have let us down. We have to move beyond things that we thought were going to happen but haven't yet happened. We have to leave those on the other side of the Jordan. And we got to prepare ourselves to follow the Ark of the Covenant, to allow God to split the waters. He says, I've made a way where there seems to be no way. I'm a way maker. I'm a miracle worker. I'm a promise keeper. That's not what I do. That's who I am. That's his word for you today. See, they were stuck in doubt, fear, unbelief, and disobedience. God had to kill one generation and raise up a new generation. That old generation represents our old mindsets, our old belief systems, our old patterns of thinking, our old way of doing things, our old friends, our old nature. See, we can't club on Saturday and praise on Sunday. Those days are over with in this new season that we're living in. See, you can come in that way, but we can't stay that way. See, I came to God. I was lost. I was broken. I knew nothing about him. I was a drug addict. I was an alcoholic. I was doing what I wanted to do. I didn't know anything. And when I got saved, there was a process of being changed. There was a process of transforming. We as the church have to understand that that's, the church is a refuge. The church is a hospital. The church is an emergency room. There's people in crisis. They need what we have on the inside. When they come, they, they, the members come running up to me in my church. Hey, they smell like weed. I'm like, well, tell them, come on in my office. I, I want to talk to them. I want to get to know them. They should smell like weed in the beginning. Y'all with me this morning? We got to go in. We got to move forward. We got to stop thinking about what didn't happen. And we got to cross over. See, they cross the Jordan River. See, we must take risks. We have to face fear. We must accept the challenge. Anytime you decide to do something different, anytime you decide to go forward, there's going to be a risk. Some of you are business people. Some of you understand the risk you have to take to start a business. There's entrepreneurs in this room. You understand that, that nothing's given to you. you got to work for it. you got to make decisions when nobody else wants to make a decision. That's what a leader does. That's what a father does. That's what a mother does. That's what we do. We make decisions. 
and then we become accountable and responsible for our decisions. Yeah. We have to make a decision to move forward today. See, God is gone before us. As I said, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. Some of you are sitting on words of faith. You're sitting on prophecies and you're sitting on promises that God has spoken. And I'm telling you, the way you're going to activate that promise is you got to take a step today. Yes, you got to move out. Amen. Now, this is a powerful part of the story. Once they cross the Jordan River, God tells them to go back. The scriptures bring them up real quick. It's in the book of Joshua, chapter number four. We stop at 1130, correct? 1130? Oh, yeah, you're right. My bad. Okay, I, gotta go. I forgot the clock. Forgot the clock. Look at the clock. All right. Joshua chapter number four, verses one through seven. It says, it came to pass that when all the nation were clean, passed over the Jordan, that Jehovah spoke to them unto Joshua, saying, take you 12 men out of the people, out of every tribe, a man, and command you them, saying, take you hence out of the midst of the Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, 12 stones. So he's telling them to go back and get 12 stones out of the water and carry them over with you. Lay them down in the lodging place. That means the place that they're going to sleep at tonight where you shall lodge this night. Then Joshua called the 12 men whom he had prepared of the children out of every tribe he called a man. And he took them and he said, pass over before the ark, go and get the stones, run to the next one. And he said that this may be a sign among you that when your children ask in the time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? That you shall say unto them, Because the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of Jehovah, when it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. I share this scripture with you today because this is important as we cross over. As we go from one phase to another phase, from one season to another season, from one level to another level, from one dimension to another dimension. Everything that we know about church will be challenged in the future. Everything, if, if, if we're caught up in tradition and religion, we're not going to make it. We have to have a revelation of who God is in order to do what he's called us to do. And what I'm telling you is that God is using this pattern to tell us that when he moves in your life, you must build an altar. You must remember the moments where God has never failed you. You must remember the moments when God has spoken to you. You must remember the moments when nobody can do it but God. There are miracles that have happened to you. There are things that God has done for you. There are situations that he's gotten you out of that you know nobody else can get you out of. It wasn't your good looks. It wasn't your intellect. It wasn't your charisma. It wasn't it wasn't who you are that brought you out of those situations. It was the mercy of God. Because he understood that I've got a promise for my people. But there are giants living in the middle of this promise. And I've seen what's happened to my people before when they get into situations and they don't have a memorial. When they've forgotten where they came from. When they've forgotten that it's by God's grace that they can do the things yeah, they do. Yeah. When they've forgotten those moments when they thought everything was over with, All but right. I'm a faithful God in spite of their unfaithfulness. Yeah. See, those are moments in our life where we must build altars and memorials because what's going to happen is that when we get out here in this battlefield, when we begin to take the promise of God, when we begin to fight for the word that's spoken on our life, giants are coming against us. And we're going to want to turn and we're going to run the other way. But see, what happens is those memorials become my boundaries. You see, because when I start to go backwards, I remember God touched me right there. God moved from me right there. God did something right there. There was a miracle in my life right there. My friend was dying of cancer and God healed him. I was addicted to drugs and God delivered me. I was facing 20 years, but God brought me out. My brother was laying dead, but God moved. Come on, you know that God moved in your life. He's done something for you. You need to build a memorial to the things that God has done. Because those are the things that are going to sustain you and keep you in the years to come. They put those stones at a place called Gilgal. Gilgal is a Hebrew word that comes from the root, the root word, the law. And it means commitment. This place became a place of covenant. The new generation of Israelites hadn't been circumcised because the old ones had died. And a new generation had arose. And what happened at Gil Gilgal, when they brought the stones out and they built the memorials, they made an altar and they made a new covenant with God. Yeah. They made a new commitment. They circumcised the tribes of Israel. Yeah. And I'm telling you today that our word for this year, for this season, is a new commitment. All right. A recommitment. Yeah. To cleanse our heart from the things that have gotten in and disappointed us. 
to revisit the promises of God, to revisit the things that he's done in the past. I remember the day that I got saved. Sometimes in my life, that's all I have is when I was broken, I was lost, I was a drug addict, I should be doing life in prison, but God moved for me. He did something on the inside of me. And there's a reason that everyone in this room has been saved, and it's not to just come to church. It's because there's a world that doesn't know him. There's a world that can't understand him. They see him on TV. They see people do crazy things, but that's not representing him. They need to see forgiveness. They need to see mercy. They need to see love. So once we go all in, then we begin to go out, and we begin to make a difference in the world around us. Will God's answer, Faith Family Church? We're God's people. We're God's chosen. And today is a day to make a new commitment. Today is a day to, to, to recommit ourselves to the things of God, to the ways of God, to not be conformed to the culture of the world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. You got to stand up with me real quick. Yes, Lord. I stayed on time. <laughs> Are you encouraged today? Amen. You know, when a man calls you and says, I believe that God has said that you have a word for our people, it's a very humbling thing. And I believe that God has given us this word today so that we understand moving on is simply a matter of making a decision. It's a matter of just making a decision to say, this year is going to be different. Not because I'm going to lose more weight or I'm going to go to the gym, but because I'm going to recommit myself to the things of God. Amen. I'm going to do more than just come to church. I understand that the purpose of God is greater than a Sunday morning service. That there's a mandate on my life to be an ambassador for the kingdom. That, that, that my body is an embassy of the Holy Spirit. That God's ordinances and morals and values are supposed to emanate from my being to a world around me that don't know who he is. And I'm telling you today that some of you in this room, you've been sitting on empty promises and that this year is the year of fulfillment. This year is the year that your son, your daughter, your family members coming home. They're coming back to the house of God. So I'm going to ask you today as we talk about moving on and leaving things behind. Maybe there's some of you in this room and you're starting off the new year by coming to church. You say, you know what, I'm going to do something different. And you might have went to the club last night. And that's okay. But if you want to make a commitment today to, to give yourself to the Lord and to ask God to begin to move on your life, just put your hand up with me right now. If you want to make a new commitment to the Lord today, I want you to just where you're at, I want to say a little prayer. And it's nothing fancy. Just, just say this with me. Say, Father, I'm ready to recommit my life, to lay aside the things that so easily beset me. God, I'm ready to run my race with endurance. I'm ready to face my giants so that I can fulfill the promise that you have on my life. Father, I thank you for your grace. That is what transforms us and makes us into the image of Christ. So, Father, today, I'm at you of all, making a covenant, circumcising my heart, asking you to take over my life. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank you guys so much for